Hear now the call to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let us pray. Revealing God, we would see Jesus. Open our eyes now to Christ's living presence as we attend to your word in Holy Scriptures and listen for the voice of Christ speaking to us. Through prayer and praise, through bread and wine, let us know that Jesus the Christ is in our midst and communes with us. We now join together in saying the prayer that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us listen now to God's word. Our Older Testament reading for today is Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself, and repent in dust and ashes. Our epistle reading for today is taken from Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 28. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently, because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Our gospel reading for today is taken from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Here end our readings for today. May God add his blessing to these readings of his holy word. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. Let this time of worship be a holy hour. Breathe the Holy Spirit in 
to every heart. Bid the fears and sorrows from each soul depart. Let us intentionally relate with our Lord in prayer, beginning these moments of prayer in silence. Gracious God, we thank you for your great love for us, the many blessings you pour into our lives, more than we notice, far more than we could count, even if we could notice them all. But as we come for worship, we focus on the thing we are most thankful for, your greatest gift to us, Jesus the Christ. We confess that we are in need of worship. We are in need of getting our bearings again. We are again needing to be reoriented. So we are thankful that your spirit nudged us and caused us to choose to worship you at this time. God, we confess that there are many things in this world that trouble and perplex and bother and frustrate us. So we are grateful for this opportunity to come to you, to focus on you, to get our bearings. Hopefully during this time of worship, we will find ourselves stretched to make more room for your spirit so that we can be better disciples for you. For all this, we give thanks through Christ our Lord. Amen. I don't know if you know this, but our scripture reading for today is about a sandwich and about imperfect people. Now, the sandwich isn't that obvious, but it's there nonetheless. The sandwich is uh, two slices of bread and then a bunch of stuff in between. And the two slices of bread are two blind men. The blind man, first of all, that's the first bread in the sandwich, is the one that Jesus heals by putting saliva on him and by touching him and by praying over him. And it takes twice because when he prays for him or heals him, the first time when he opens his eyes, he still is seeing things in a blurry kind of way. So then Jesus patiently approaches him again, and the second time, this man can see. Fast forward a few chapters, and we come to the second slice of bread, and this slice of bread is about another blind man. This one on the outskirts of Jericho, and here we find Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. And in Mark, when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, he's on his way to the cross. And as Jesus is leaving Jericho, here is this blind man who calls out. And Jesus ends up restoring his sight again. Mark, I think, by using that sandwich is trying to tell us that with Jesus' help and with Jesus' power and by following Jesus, we begin to see more clearly. Now, what about the imperfect people? There are a whole bunch of them in this sandwich in the center between those two slices of bread. Imperfect people everywhere. First of all, you may have noticed in the scripture reading that the crowd tried to keep this man from approaching Jesus. The crowd tried to hold him back. The crowd tried to keep him from getting the healing that he ended up receiving. Now, many in that day thought that if someone were blind, it was a result of their sin or their parents' sin. But since this scripture points out that the man used to be able to see, then the parents are off the hook, but this guy is now blind because of something he probably did and is a social outcast, is low on the totem pole, and probably shouldn't be bothering Jesus at all. So the crowd is imperfect. The crowd tries to keep that man from the healing Jesus can offer. The other imperfect people, and they're imperfect from the opening of Mark up until the end. Those are his disciples. 
the ones who have spent large amounts of time with him, the ones who have seen him perform marvelous wonders, the ones who have seen and heard his teachings, they are the ones who are imperfect. You see, in between those two slices of bread, those two blind healings, we find those disciples making mistake after mistake after mistake. You see, during this sandwich time, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what lies ahead. And during this sandwich time, Jesus is letting them know that things are going to get rough. And he does that by what is known as three passion predictions. That is, not once, not twice, but three times, Jesus lets his disciples know quite clearly what is going to happen. Three times he tells them that he's going to be handed over, he's going to be tortured, he's going to be killed, but he will rise again. Three times. And those imperfect disciples, how do they respond? Well, after that first passion prediction, Peter grabs Jesus by the collar, pulls him aside, and rebukes him for saying what he's just said. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. In other words, Peter doesn't get it at all. And if Jesus listens to Peter's voice, he will be led from the path that he has been called to follow. Some time passes. They journey on toward Jerusalem. I imagine Jesus continues to teach them and to try to help them. And then Jesus offers that second passion prediction right there in the middle of our sandwich. And again, it's pretty much like the first one. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And I will rise again. And this time, right after he tells them this horrible thing he's going to experience, you know what happens? Those disciples, as they walk along behind him, argue about which one of them is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Which one of them will be the greatest? Well, Jesus doesn't give up on them. So as they walk further along and get closer to Jericho, where our scripture is for today, Jesus again offers that third passion prediction. Again, he says quite clearly, rough times lie ahead. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to die. And I'll rise again. And do you know what happens then? Those imperfect disciples keep right on being imperfect. Those imperfect disciples, James and John, come to Jesus and have the nerve, after what he's just told them, to ask him which one of them will be sitting on his left hand and which one will sit on his right hand in his kingdom. They're asking for special privilege. Imperfect disciples. And in our last slice of bread, we find this Bartimaeus, this son of Timaeus, by the road, blind, wrapped up in his cloak, the only thing he has to keep him warm on those cold nights. And he hears that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he must have known something about this Jesus because he just begins to shout out, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And that imperfect crowd, as I've told you, tries to silence him, tries to hold him back, tries to keep him from receiving what he wants. But Jesus learns, and Jesus gives him permission. So the crowd lets him know that it's okay. Jesus says you can approach. And you know what he does? I mean, just like that, he hops up, throws off his cloak, and sprints over to where Jesus is. 
and there in front of Jesus, he calls him teacher, and Jesus asks him what he can do for him. Just like he asked James and John, and they had the nerve to say, I want to be on your right hand, and I want to be on your left hand. But when Jesus asked this man what he can do for him, he has the right answer. He says, Jesus, I would like to see again. And Jesus says, because of your faith, you have been healed, and that healing occurs. And did you notice, this time, unlike that first blind healing, Jesus doesn't put saliva on the man. Jesus doesn't touch the man. Jesus just speaks. And can't you imagine how reassuring that was for the little church that Mark is leading back at that time and writing this scripture for? Can't you just imagine that some of them had thought, well, if we'd actually been touched by Jesus, things might be different. But Mark is letting them know that even though Jesus has risen and ascended, his voice can still teach, can still heal, can still inspire. And then this guy again gets it right because after the healing takes place, we're told that he follows Jesus on the way. That means he becomes a disciple. He becomes a student and a follower of Jesus. And he becomes a part of that parade that we know of as Jesus triumphantly enters the city to the praise of the crowds. Now, I told you that this scripture is full of imperfect people. The crowd is imperfect. They try to keep one of God's beloved suffering children from approaching his only son for healing. But did you notice what Jesus does with that imperfect crowd? He invites them to extend the invitation to Bartimaeus to come. You know what else he does for that crowd? He doesn't rebuke them or condemn them. He invites them into his ministry by extending that invitation. The other imperfect people those 12 disciples. It's clear that over and over again, even as Jesus is trying to prepare them lovingly for what lies ahead, they just don't get it. They have eyes to see, but when it comes to spiritual things, they're almost blind as bats. But we shouldn't be too hard on those disciples. I don't know if any of you had the experience where you're just at the end of your rope, you have small children, and you say to them, you know, dad really needs for you to behave tonight. I am at my wit's end. I can't handle it anymore. And you know what usually happens? They start acting up. They start doing crazy things. That's because children count on us when all else fails to be in control and to set boundaries because they know they're not wise enough and not strong enough to do it for themselves. So those disciples, when they hear that Jesus is going to die, they don't even hear the resurrection part. When they hear that Jesus is going to die, it probably causes them to just panic. And it probably causes them, like Peter, to tell Jesus, no, no, let's not do that. Or like the bunch of disciples to start jockeying for position of leadership when Jesus is gone. Or like James and John to get security of setting by him. And how does Jesus handle those imperfect disciples? Jesus loves them. Jesus continues to teach them. Jesus continues to pray for them. 
Jesus continues to walk with them and work with them right up to the cross and through the resurrection and beyond. And if we're honest, there are other imperfect people in this story. Those imperfect people are you and me. Over and over again, we too are blind to the ways that God is working in our world. Over and over again, we have this tiny picture of God and this tiny picture of Jesus, and we hold on to that and want to keep it that way. Now, if you'll notice, I didn't say that Bartimaeus was perfect. I mean, we're going to find out that later on, all the disciples, and that must have been Bartimaeus too, fled like chickens whenever Jesus was arrested. And they weren't there to see him through to his bitter end. No, Bartimaeus wasn't perfect. And Bartimaeus and you and me do indeed fall short of what it means. But this Jesus keeps on loving us, keeps on inviting us, keeps on using us to share his good news with the world all the way to a cross, all the way to hell and back, this Jesus doesn't give up on imperfect people. Thanks be to God. Amen. I bind my heart this tide to the Galilean side. To the wounds of Calvary, to the Christ who died for me. I bind my soul this day to the brother far away and the sister near at hand in this town and in this land. I have the honor now to extend an invitation. It's an honor because it's not my invitation, it's our Lord's invitation. An invitation to join him at his table. An invitation to rub elbows with him and our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this invitation is for all. All of us who are far from perfect are welcome to this table where we can again be healed by him and be led by him. Let us join him at his table. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Eat of it in remembrance of me. In like manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. Again giving thanks, Jesus said, This is my very life poured out for you. Drink of it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that even though we are far from perfect, you invite us and welcome us to your table. We thank you that here at this table, we are fed on your word, on your leadership, on your very being. And we pray that as we leave this table, 
we can share that hospitality with the world. For all this, we give thanks through Christ our Lord. Amen. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit Divine. We have fed on his word, we have fed on his very being at his table. May we find ourselves filled with the Spirit so that we can be better disciples. Disciples who go forth in peace to love and to serve our Lord. Amen.